Um, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, present my friend Mike Schulte, who's a, a data scientist in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, for those of you in the New York area, um, home of uh, birthplace of Derek Jeter, uh, who was a data scientist uh, domiciled in the Bronx or something like that. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, so Mike, would you uh, take it away, please? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Mike Schulte. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Uh, I work as a statistical consultant for a company called Blue Granite, which is located in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, I'm an R programmer primarily these days, although we work mostly with the Microsoft stack. So we work in SQL Server and all of the tools around SQL Server, uh, as well as a lot of the uh, business intelligence add-ins in Excel. Uh, but I am the data scientist on our 35-person company. Uh, I also teach math, economics, and philosophy at uh, two local schools, at Western Michigan University and more recently at Kalamazoo Valley Community College. Um, and I'm an aspiring data scientist. I'm, uh, I think, like everyone else, still trying to figure out what that even means. But uh, we certainly have, have some fun trying to figure it out. In a previous lifetime, I worked as a SAS programmer as well. Uh, so I've got a fair bit of background working with data. Um, and sorry, right sorry. now, what we're finding, what, go ahead. Mike, I just wanted to jump in because I think this, this is so cool. Once upon a time, Mike was actually a fireman. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> just, just long enough to meet my wife, and then I said there was no need for that anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and if you're wondering, I'll be in New York uh, in roughly 24 hours, and uh, I'm coming there to ring bells at Trinity Church downtown. Uh, we'll be ringing bells all day from about 8 a.m. on Saturday till 7.30 p.m., I think. Uh, so I will be in New York uh, in just, well, Saturday morning. I'm staying out in Newark because I don't know about what you guys are thinking in New York, but I can't afford to buy a house for a day. So... Uh, so staying out in New York. But uh, uh, all right, so uh, I'll, I'll make these slides available, and my email address is on there if you want to get a hold of me with further questions. Uh, but our company is starting down this path of big data. We work for a lot of uh, sort of mid-sized companies. We don't work for the really big companies very much. Uh, I used to work as an, uh, as an employee at Kellogg's, for instance. So we don't work typically for companies that large. We work for sort of the next level down. Uh, and what we're finding is they're just starting to get into this whole big data thing. And uh, so we've been starting to uh, teach ourselves how to do this stuff and uh, get ready to present it to our clients. So I'm not an expert yet by any means. I'm learning this uh, right now. And today I'm just going to share some of the stuff that I've learned with you guys. So, I, Mike, I, if we yes. have questions, uh, feel you, free if we to have ask. Questions? Would you like? A... Great. You won't hurt my feelings by interrupting. Uh, um, <laughs> so, I, I, a quick I, I question. To... Then. Okay, go ahead. Aaron. Quick question about you. You mentioned. Um, uh, let's see that uh, you work a lot in R and the and, and the Microsoft stack side of things. Do you yes. do you find? Um, in terms of of operating systems that most people are dealing with, are, are you finding like Linux, uh, Mac, or Windows systems more more typically in use? Or we uh, I, I don't know the exact number anymore, but roughly 80 percent of our clients come to us through Microsoft, so it's very heavily Windows. Uh, but that again is that's mostly a product of who our clients are and and that we've partnered with Microsoft. Uh, so we work almost exclusively in a Windows environment. Those of us that are starting to play with Hadoop, uh, we, we typically, we run Linux, but we refuse to run a separate Linux machine, so we use virtual machines. Uh, that, that way we can still pretend we're using Windows. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Mike, I, I have a different question for you. Yes. Uh, you say that you worked on SAS, and now you are working on R. So yes. what uh, motivated you to move to R from SAS? Uh, SAS is a huge competitor of Microsoft, so I'm not allowed to use it. Oh, okay. 
Uh, on top of that, we uh, we already ask our clients to pay a lot for software, right? SQL Server is not inexpensive, um, and That's so true. it's nice to have an open source, non-competing tool that we can use alongside those things. Microsoft is actually embracing R pretty heavily, um, so there's there's a lot coming down the road with Microsoft and R, um, much of which is still being figured out even as we speak. Uh, it's hard to say a whole lot more than that because they're very tight-lipped about what they've got that they aren't releasing yet, but uh, but Microsoft is very friendly with the R environment. SAS they view as a competitor. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I actually like R better, if that matters. I, I find it it's more flexible, it's quicker to uh, develop quick demos. Uh, certainly SAS is quite capable, but I find R more friendly for, for myself. All right, so uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys what you think uh, about big data. Uh, we hear this a lot. You hear it in the news. Uh, IBM runs commercials on television these days talking about big data, talking about predictive analytics. So what do you think big data is? R. I guess. <laughs> I, I, personally, I've been struggling with that one a little bit. I mean... The question is, seems to be, you know, when does that really help, right? I mean, I guess the, the my impression is that there's a theory out there, what was it, that Google introduced that pretty much that the, the amount of data trumps algorithms, something like that. Um, so there's a thought that the more data you have, the more accurate predictions you can make if you just deal with all of it. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in? I'm, I'll jump in. Um, for me, big data is there's such a large quantity of it that the only way you could really manage it is with multiple different I for me applications or tools in which you can extrapolate as much information as possible. Um, I, I came from pharmaceuticals and not in healthcare, and to me, there's a lot of data in both fields, so and, and there's a lot of questions asked, and 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 so how do you then pro provide solutions that can't just be say taken away by just making a presentation, but rather you actually showing the patterns and trends, and so big data for me is a large set that has to eventually be processed, but give a lot of information. That's the way I look at it. Right. Okay, yep, so I, I think we're on the right track. There's there's not really a single answer out there yet. Uh, the way I tend to yeah. think of it, oh, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Uh, I, I, I was going to say that uh, big data is, uh, is a very complex data collection, as everybody said, and which is not uh, maintainable by our, uh, our so-called RDBMS. That's what uh, my understanding is. Right, so, so the, the consensus seems to be building behind a definition of big data that it's too large and too complex for the current tool set that we have. Uh, you know, so we're having to develop new tools, uh, one of which is Hadoop, which we're talking about tonight. Uh, so, you know, we have large data sets. We've always worked with large data sets. When I worked at Kellogg's, you know, we had uh, a terabyte of data that we were processing uh, for, for various analyses. Uh, so large data sets are not new, but what we mean by big data is that it's so big that the tools we've been using are just no longer adequate by themselves. And so we have to do something to increase our capabilities. Uh, some of the trends in the discussion right now uh, are... Uh, uh, these are the things that you hear about the most in terms of uh, big data. Uh, the one thing we'll talk a little bit more about here in a bit is uh, that data is expanding. Right? We'll look at some numbers in just a bit, but the amount of data that we're collecting is, is just tremendous. I think uh, a recent estimate said that 90% of the world's data has been generated in the last two years only. You know, the other 10% is all of time before that. Uh, 
Um, that's probably even out of date now, because that's a little bit of an older reference. Uh, a second thing that's that's driving the big data discussion is is not only are we collecting more data, uh, but we're collecting a lot of different types of data. Uh, you know, it used to be that you dealt with uh, numerical and character data, and and maybe you know the, the the complicated data would be dates, right, or strings that you have to parse in a particular way, uh, but but nothing too fancy. Uh, you know, now what what other types of data are we collecting? That uh, that sort of challenge that that are making us have to work a little bit harder. Anybody have any experience with that? Image data. Image data certainly. Just natural language processing, text, all the text data and everything. That's coming. Yeah, text data, but very unstructured, right? Just lots and lots right. of right. of text. What else have you guys worked with this semester even? Now, I'm not supposed to ask a question I don't know the answer to, but I guess I don't know the answer to that one, right? What have you guys worked with so far this semester? Let's see. You can say so, uh, social media type <laughs> that's very highly interconnected. Uh, okay, social media right. data, yeah. yeah. Social media. Have you worked at all with mapping data? Yeah, Mark, trying to get, trying to work with that. That's a little challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it certainly is. I uh, I once built a Google Maps. Uh, don't tell my boss. I once built a Google Maps application, <laughs> mapping all of the letters written by Rene Descartes. So we we put in the <laughs> latitude and longitude for their origin and destination, and you could view on a map with a slider. You know all of the letters that he sent in a certain time period, uh, and so we're starting to see capability to do things like that. Uh, you know, you're starting to see a lot of business intelligence tools that are capable of producing very nice maps. So you could take, uh, for instance, you could take census data, and you could take data from a moving company, and you could combine those and create a map to show how much of the market they're capturing with their own moves. You know, and so you you look at a map and it says in Detroit. You know they're performing at about 100 moves a week, and there are maybe 3,000 moves a week. Um, you know, so they're able to visually see that now. So we're working with a lot of different types of data. Uh, the the third thing that's driving the discussion is that we're working with all of this data, and of course CEOs are not very patient. They want answers pretty quickly. So not only do we have high volumes of data, but we have to process it quickly. And so the economics of that are becoming an important factor as well. Um, you know, when I worked at Kellogg, I ran an analysis routinely, you know, about once a week, that I'd click run on Friday, come in on Monday, and hope it had finished. Uh, you know, so we're starting to try to speed that up. We're trying to be able to click run on Friday and have that answer by Friday afternoon instead of Monday. Uh, and then you just, you hear a lot of hype about big data, too. I think there are a lot of people out there that they like to say it because other people are saying it, and so you're hearing a lot of conversation. Uh, as the world tries to figure out what this all means for us coming down the road. Uh, so data volumes, uh, you know, we we do small demos with datas, data sets that are on the scale of megabytes up to maybe a gigabyte, uh, laptop computers, you know, typical data sets that I process on my laptop would be you know, somewhere from 10 to 300 gigabytes. Uh, you know, I think I have a one terabyte hard drive. Uh, you know, when you get up in, into that range, one or five or ten terabytes, you start dealing with servers, uh, and then big data is starting to be, uh, you know, hundred terabytes or a petabyte. Uh, you know, really, really big data sets that most of our computers probably can't handle. Uh, you know, so we're we're dealing with just increasing volumes of data. Uh, we've we've already talked about some of these social media data. Uh, we're doing a, a project right now for Western Michigan University, which deals with uh, with calling for fundraising. Uh, you know, so we're processing a lot of the uh, written notes that the people making the calls have recorded. Uh, you know, processing various legal documents, for instance, or um, you know, just all sorts of data. You know, we, we collect data from sensors, and and we want to be able to process that. So light sensors, or heat sensors, or or sound. Uh, you know, and and just 
you know, on top of all of this, we have all of the routine data sets that we've been collecting all along, uh, but we have more of that. You know, I imagine how much data is generated at your local grocery store in a single day for every single purchase. Right? You know, it's just tremendous amounts of data that we didn't used to be able to work with. And some of it is structured, and some of it is unstructured, and so we have to be able to cope with both. Um, the economics of processing all of this data is, is relatively straightforward. For a long time, the best way for you to, um, to handle larger data volumes was to increase the capability of your server. And uh, to a point that works, and you can see here the purple curve indicates cost using just a single server. Right, as you make it more and more capable. Initially, it's less expensive than going with what we're going to discuss today, the scale out with a, a massively parallel processing system. Uh, but as you go higher and higher in the data volume, uh, you know, the, the single server is no longer cost effective. Right? You know, to go from uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM in your server to 64 costs a lot more than it costs to go from 16 to 32. Right? So the cost as you try to make that one computer more and more powerful just skyrockets. Uh, what we're going to look at instead is an approach where you take a lot of ordinary computers and work them all together at once. And we're going to call that massively parallel processing. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in just a bit and you'll see how that works. The, uh, all of the hype around big data, you're seeing articles published every day. Uh, so here are just some example quotes that uh, Rob Kerr pulled. He's, one of, he's our chief technical officer at Blue Granite. Uh, so he pulled some of these quotes. Uh, you know, there are companies that ignore big data at their peril, and that can be very expensive. Uh, here's the quote from IBM about 90% of the data in the world today created in just the last two years. Um, so there's a lot of hype around big data. It, it's, it's something that as a data scientist you won't be able to ignore. You're going to have to know how to work with this stuff. Uh, so today I'll give you just a little bit of a preview of how you might be able to work with that. Uh, you know, some people are asking whether this hype is justified, but I mean, you can already see examples where companies are using it and doing very well. All you have to do the next time you want to order a book is go to Amazon.com and you'll see big data at work right off the bat. You know, every time you look and they say, people like you have also bought this book or that book. Uh, you know, that's big data at work. They're one of the, uh, one of the leaders in this industry. Uh, so I think the hype is justified. Most of the people I work with think the hype is justified. It's not just a matter of getting a larger server with more memory and more processing capability. We really do have to start looking at other approaches. So uh, you know, what's driving all of this, again, just increasing data volume, increasing data variety, and increasing data velocity, right? how fast we want to be able to process it. Uh, and there is a lot of hype around this. So let, let's take a break for questions at this point, just to see if there's anybody that has a question so far. OK. Uh, I guess, uh, well, one question, actually. So you um, you're talking about you, you've mentioned the three V's. I've also heard a fourth V thrown out there, which is veracity. Uh, how do you uh, check that you're you're getting good data? Any any uh, comments around that one? I haven't actually heard that formally said, but certainly you always want to make sure you're doing good work. Uh, have you guys done a data mining course yet? Anything with data mining? We learned, we learned some data mining techniques, but not, not a formal course in it yet. OK. Uh, most of my work is, right now at least, in data mining. But uh, you know, one of the things we do is we, use a, we, we partition our data into two or sometimes three or even four data sets. And so we train our models on the first data set. We try to build what we think is the best model. And then we spend time testing that on other data sets that we know the right answers, typically. Uh, to make sure that what we're coming up with is reliable. Uh, so yeah, that certainly is important. The, uh, uh, the one thing I would caution you, uh, the philosopher in me says, you know, veracity, the truth of what we're doing. I don't think models capture the truth. I think models either work or they don't. 
but I, I, I'm reluctant to say that a model captures the truth. Right? It, 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 at best, it gives us a good approximation of what we expect the outcome to be, but you can get that from different models. Right? You can, in fact, you can build what we would call an ensemble model, which takes, for instance, five different classification algorithms, combines each of those individual results into a, um, you know, think about a voting system or think about the BCS, right? You've got several polls, you've got several computer models, all of that is combined into producing one output. So I'm not sure that truth is a good thing to say about modeling, uh, but certainly we want to make sure our results are reliable. I mean, we don't want companies making bad decisions from, from bad models. Uh, but I had not heard that before. I had not heard veracity as a fourth V. Uh, I'm going to have to run that past Rob Kerr and see what he thinks. <laughs> I guess you could also apply it to just the your your raw data as well, right? Like making sure that you, you get good data into your system. Yeah. So there's yeah. yeah, how much of your time do you typically spend on preparing the, and cleaning up the data? And, you know, it's usually well more than half, right? If you're, uh, if you're fortunate enough to work in a company where they provide you with clean data when you start, that's wonderful. But uh, that's pretty rare in my field, at least. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to have a, a zip code column where you're scanning down the list of zip codes and all of a sudden you stumble on a zip code that says, turn left at Rose Street. <laughs> so, so what do you do with that, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, I think it could apply in a lot of different ways. Uh, the honesty of the results that you present. You don't want to use a model that you don't actually think is good, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think I might add that to my, to my list of Vs. That's a very good point. <laughs> how how much are you are you finding that you're spending um, in sort of the statistical model side of things? Uh, in the actual like you know algorithm side. Very little. It's um, you know if you do your data prep correctly, you almost know the right model before you even build it. Um, you know you notice things like uh, you know for instance. We know that people with higher income are more likely to donate and donate a lot of money. Uh, you know, so when we build our model that recommends who they should call next, we already know that'll be a factor, right? So building the model is almost just, you know, it's it's the it's almost the proofreading or that final draft once you've done all the hard work. Uh, so I love statistics and statistical modeling, and unfortunately, most of my time is spent in the data prep side. You know, probably 70% or 80% on average. Um, but that's how you really get to know what you have in your data. I guess, are you using like machine learning techniques or, you know, like... We do. We do some clustering work and, uh, and some classification work for a couple of our companies right now. Um, we, we've done some forecasting that's not really machine learning, but it's... Uh, it's sort of grouped under the heading of predictive analytics, right? Forecasting and machine learning. Um, you know, so what we're finding though is the companies we work for are just getting started in this space. So, you know, a lot of our time is spent preparing their data, but even before that, a lot of our time is being spent just trying to figure out what kinds of questions we can answer for them. Um, and and some of those are machine learning, and some of those are more traditional statistics. Mm -hmm. Are you finding uh, that uh, some of the questions you can an ask if you're trying to get into this are like, wh you know, what's, where's my time best spent? Is it getting more data or is it, you know, improving my algorithm to be more accurate? Are, are you answering those types of questions for people as well? Uh, a little bit, do yeah. Do I have enough data? We, we've done a couple of... Uh, uh, projects where they just didn't have sufficient data. So we went back to them and said, you know, these models just won't be good enough until you collect another year's worth of data. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, a project for uh, for Goodwill Industries. We were trying to uh, forecast donations more accurately than what they had. You know, what they were using for, say, forecasting November's donations was November the previous year. And so, uh, you know, we were trying to do a little bit better than that, trying to build in some weather data, uh, but they just didn't have enough data for us to build a reliable model. Uh, so we said, you know, one of the things we said was, you know, start collecting more, more detailed data. Um, you know, instead of collecting weekly, try collecting daily. 
Uh, but so, you know, we're running into that with some of our clients that they don't have big data. They think they have big data, right? But if I can process it on my laptop, it's probably not big data. It's, um, uh, we, you know, we've gone back and recommended some experiments for companies to try, some A-B testing kind of experiments. You know, call these people but make this sort of a pitch to them and then call this other group of people, make that sort of a pitch, then come back with that data and we'll try running the algorithms again. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of that as well. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Mike, I have one question. Um, sure. Is, is big data like better than like smaller data? I mean, there seems to be this perception that big data is like the best. Well, big yeah, data I don't know. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's better. There's certainly information there that you want to extract if you can. Uh, you know, traditional statistics is typically all about extracting as much information you can from as little data as you can. Right? You know, you think of a clinical trial. You don't want to put more patients than you have to through a clinical trial. So you, you try to figure out what's your minimum reliable sample size, and then you try to extract as much information from that as you can. You know, data mining, machine learning, we no longer do that. We now take the massive data sets that we just have, and we try to learn from those. So I don't know that I'd say it's better. It's certainly different. Uh, but I think there's a place for both, and it just depends on the uh, use case. Mike, uh, how much math and statistics do you use uh, in, in your work? I mean, how much uh, training, if I, if I can ask it, you know, how much training in, in the two disciplines do you think are needed? Maybe that's, maybe it's limitless, limitless but <laughs> on average. Yeah, so you know, as a consultant, I spend a lot of time learning new things so that we can stay a few steps ahead of our clients. Uh, so I don't think you'll ever be done learning in this field. But uh, uh, you know, we, we find a lot of good work can be done by people who just have a, a bachelor's degree in math or statistics even. Uh, because most of the traditional degrees, of course this doesn't apply to you guys, but most of the traditional degrees aren't teaching these new technologies. They're teaching calculus, they're teaching uh, survival analysis or categorical data analysis, design of experiments, uh, but, but we're moving beyond that now. Right? That's traditional statistics. You're, you're lucky to find a program that has an elective course in predictive analytics of some sort. Um, so how much training do you need? I don't know. I, I mean, generally more is better, uh, but at some point you need to go out and just start doing projects. Right, even starting simple, do some pro bono work for local nonprofits. See what you can do. Uh, take advantage of Andy's uh, predilection for giving you projects in your courses. Right, make that something good. It doesn't have to be massive. Uh, you know, I, I gave a student a data set on jury discrimination and 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 demographics for the jury selection over the course of a three-year period, and you know, she made a very nice 20-minute presentation using just intro to statistics, right? That's all she had had was one introductory course. Uh, so I, th I think, the, you know, you've got to learn stuff, but you also have to do stuff. All right, let, let's move on. We can uh, come back with more questions as we go, but uh, um, here I thought we would only be 10 minutes in at this point. Uh, so massively, massively parallel processing. Uh, what is it? It's, uh, it's a, a relatively straightforward process. It's a divide and conquer approach, right? You take your massive data set, you divide it into various partitions, you distribute each partition to a different person, or a different computer in this case, but to a different, uh, what we call a node. And then there's one node that's in charge that marshals all of the other ones and tells them what their work has to be. All of the individual nodes go and, and do their work, and then they send their results back to the control node for that final aggregation into a result. And so here's a, uh, uh, a visual representation of that, right? Partition the work, send it to the workers, get the individual results, and gather those back together into, uh, into a final result that you can then pass on to the client. Uh, so that's what massively parallel processing is about. 
uh, as, as an example of that, um, whoop, there we go. Uh, you can imagine one really large 400 ton dump truck costs five million dollars. It can handle 400 tons, but that's it. It doesn't scale beyond that. Uh, if you want another one, you've got to buy another five million dollar dump truck. Uh, you can compare that with seven smaller dump trucks that uh, the total cost is just one million dollars for all seven. Uh, each has a capacity of 25 tons and if, if you need to expand your capacity you go out and you buy one more dump truck. Right? It, it's much more flexible and in, in for large amounts it becomes much more cost effective. Right? Um, so that, that's the basic idea here of massively parallel programming. Uh, so here's an example of a Hadoop cluster that's, uh, that was set up at Boise State University. And you can see they have 63 nodes. And each node is just a typical desktop computer. Right? So they're not spending thousands of dollars on a single massive computer. They're just, I mean, you can set up a Hadoop cluster on computers people get rid of when they get out of college. Right? You can take 10 of those, string them all together, and set up a Hadoop cluster. Right? So it's, it's, it's very cost effective. It's using resources we already in many cases have uh, that aren't serving any other useful purpose. Right? So it lets us recycle older equipment or it lets us invest in low cost equipment. Uh, another important part of this is that it allows for redundancy. Right? The information doesn't get written to just one node. It actually gets written to several nodes. And of course you can adjust how many depending on the importance of the redundancy. Uh, but you can imagine if you write the information to three different computers and one of them fails, that's a lot safer because you still have it on two other nodes. Uh, so it allows inexpensive redundancy. If you have one very expensive server and it fails, you're out of luck. Uh, but this allows for a lot more flexibility and a lot more reliability. The, uh, the Hadoop stack is constantly evolving. Uh, at the base of it is what's called the Hadoop distributed file system and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second but basically that's that's the storage mechanism for all of the data right it distributes it across all of the various machines on top of that you have what we call map reduce uh, which is you, you can almost think of it like an API right it, it's what allows us to issue instructions so that all of this data that's spread across all of these machines can be processed properly. And then uh, this is actually, this slide even is a year old and it's, it's massively out of date because there are so many more tools now on top of just those four for, for interacting with Hadoop. Uh, Hive is for SQL developers who don't want to learn something other than SQL. Um, so it's, it's almost a cheat. Um, you know, so uh, you know, who typically dealt with all of this stuff, right, over, over as it started to develop? It, it was all of the database developers that were responsible for, for developing the, the new stuff. So somebody got the bright idea to create Hive, which is allowing SQL developers to use their already existing skills. Um, and so if you already know SQL really well, Hive is very easy to pick up. Uh, all of these, though, end up translating the tasks into MapReduce. Uh, the most common programming language for interacting with Hadoop right now is Java. I'm going to use Java today, although I confess that I am not a Java programmer, so I copied and pasted the script from someone else. Um, you know, good teachers borrow, better teachers steal, right? So uh, you know, I, I, I took a lot of code from some of my colleagues that, that they put together, and I took some code from uh, free tutorials online just to show you how it works today. Uh, most of the interaction that I do with Hadoop is going to be through R. So R has yet another mechanism for reaching out to Hadoop. Uh, you also see things like Mahout, which has all of the machine learning algorithms. Uh, there's something called Squoop, S-Q-O-O-P, uh, which is uh, a cross between SQL and Hadoop, right? It's a way for interacting with Hadoop using SQL. All of these tools are developing very rapidly as people try to figure out what needs to be done. Uh, in fact, MapReduce, I've heard a rumor, I'm not 100% sure yet, but I've heard a rumor that it's no longer called MapReduce, that it's actually now being called YARN. I don't know what YARN stands for, I'm trying to find out, but the concept will be the same. Uh, so this is constantly evolving. So we, 
Um, you know, if you if you buy a book from 2011 on Hadoop, odds are half of it won't work. So just be careful with that. One of the exciting things about this industry is that it's constantly evolving, and we get to learn new and exciting stuff. Of course, that means you have to learn it, and that's not always easy. Uh, so the the Hadoop distributed file system builds in that redundancy of storage that we talked about uh, in order to store data reliably, but using inexpensive hardware. Right? We don't want to use expensive hardware. Uh, you know, we run into all of those limitations that when you try to add more and more memory to the same machine, prices skyrocket. Um, you know, so we're trying to use inexpensive hardware, but a lot of it. And uh, we expect hardware failures. You know, whether it's just a disk drive failure or a you know, a fire or, you know, whatever happens. By distributing the data re redundantly across multiple machines, we, we expect that and we can handle that. Uh, it's intended for large files and typically, although this is changing, uh, it's designed for large batch inserts. So you send your massive data set, your control node splits it up and sends it to the various uh, uh, data nodes. Uh, the, the typical process for that, the client, which would be um, you know, the machine that the user is on, will have a large data set and will send it to the master. And the master machine will determine where to send each partition, how large each partition needs to be, and will issue instructions. And then the file will be sent across the various machines. And this is just one example of a relatively simple process. Again, it could be splitting it across hundreds of machines. Right? So here we only have three, but um, you know, this, this can be hundreds of machines. But there is that one master name node that determines where everything goes, and that also then aggregates the results at the end. So this is how it's written. Right? It just splits it across the various machines. And then the, uh, the opposite process is just the master, again, would coordinate how the data is read back from those individual machines to the client. Right? So this is the Hadoop distributed file system. It just, you know, it coordinates that partitioning and breaking up of the data. Uh, MapReduce is the other key component. It's a programming model. Uh, again, very similar to an API, uh, but it's designed to allow for all of these very complicated computations that are going to be done. You know, the one we're going to see today is just a really trivial example. I mean, you could do it by hand, but it, it'll illustrate how it works. Um, and, and again, it, it's, it's very similar to an API, and of course the good news is that Hadoop is open source. There are companies that will sell you Hadoop. Uh, what you're really buying from them, uh, in addition to the software, is their support. Uh, but Hadoop is open source, and at the end I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where you could get your hands on uh, a virtual machine, then you could play with this. Uh, but you know, there are new ones being added, quite quite a lot right now, as as more and more people, because it's open source, they're developing bigger and better versions every day. So a typical big, big data problem: uh, you have a large number of records, or not even records, might even just be unstructured data, and you want to extract something of interest, and then you're going to shuffle and sort those results. That's the mapping process. Right, where you go through your data and you try to uh, extract something from the individual records. The reducing process is when you then try to put it all back together, aggregate the results, and generate your final output. So MapReduce is actually two separate pieces. Uh, I'm sure you guys already know a lot about this stuff, but common uses, recommendation engines, Amazon for instance, uh, Pandora, if you listen to music on Pandora, they have a recommendation engine. Uh, you know, all sorts of companies are starting to do that. In fact, the ones that do better at that typically thrive, and the ones that aren't so good are, are finding that they're not doing as well. Um, uh, market campaign, marketing campaign analysis, I did a lot of that for Kellogg's, uh, you know, looking at different promotional campaigns and seeing how well they worked. Uh, right now we're doing a lot of projects for universities trying to segment donors. Uh, but cell phone companies do a lot of segmentation to figure out what makes customers stay and what makes them leave. Uh, you know, the, the typical example in data mining courses that you see first or, or very early is, uh, you know, some of you might even have seen the German credit data set. Uh, you know, I've taken 
several data mining courses and workshops, and I think I've had that data set come up seven or eight times in different workshops. It really kind of bugs me now because I want to see new data sets. I don't want to see the same thing I already know. Uh, but loan approvals, you know, determining who's good or bad credit risk is a common uh, use. And you're starting to see a lot more with fraud detection. The IRS uses a lot of big data to try to determine who they should audit. Uh, so I think the, the main takeaway from this, uh, this lesson will be get a job with the IRS so you can learn about their fraud detection process so that you can avoid being audited. But uh, uh, you know, So these are just some examples. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look here in just a second, but uh, in case you didn't already know it, the guy who developed Hadoop, the way he decided what to name it was his son's stuffed elephant, which was named Hadoop. So that's why you'll see an elephant as the symbol for Hadoop, um, and that's where the name comes from. All right, again, I'll pause for questions briefly. We have about 10 minutes, which is, is plenty of time to show a very quick demonstration. Uh, but before that, any questions? Quick question on, so on the hardware side of things, did, did the machines need to be dedicated to the Hadoop, or could you potentially use uh, extra capacity around your com company kind of thing. I don't know if you're familiar with like what SETI was doing a long uh, time ago with like right. a screensaver type thing. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that you could do that. I, 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 we don't do it. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, what are called parallel data warehouses. That's where we're focusing our efforts and they're typically dedicated. But uh, I, I don't know why you couldn't have other things also running um, and have just some of the space dedicated on that machine. I'm, I'm not sure though. I honestly don't know the answer to that. <coughs> I believe theoretically it is possible, but uh, since this data processing is uh, too much CPU intensive, it is better not to do that. Right. Uh, that, that's what I think. Okay, yeah. I mean, and again, if it's not actually running anything, it might be okay, but I, I don't know. Yeah, in, in my experience, running Java tends to take a lot of memory, so it tends to be a memory hog. So you usually right. can't hear it too much with uh, other demons. Right. Yeah, we see that with uh, SQL Server as well. We're uh, trying to figure out how we can run both R and SQL Server. R runs entirely in memory, of course, and so SQL Server is a memory hog. So we're we're finding that we sometimes have to set up a separate server just for R. Um, so I imagine Hadoop is the same way, although it probably depends how much it's being used, right? If it's only used once in a while, then certainly it doesn't seem like you should run into any problems having other stuff as well. Is, would it be possible to have these machines kind of come in and out of service on the, on the cluster? It's designed that for that, cause yeah. Problems? Yeah, it's designed for that redundancy and expansion as necessary, yeah. And do you know, I mean, it sounds like Hadoop, like I said, SETI was doing something kind of like that a long time ago, right? Where they would, they would process their, they distribute data to a bunch of different people and then aggregate that all back together. How yeah, does, wasn't it that, that people could, that uh, people could volunteer their machines during its downtime and, and they would use those machines yeah. to process? Is that, I, I, yeah, again, I uh -huh. would assume that this could work the same way. I've never tried it. I've never heard of anyone trying but, it, but I don't, theoretically, but I don't see a barrier there. In terms of, of technique, like, well, that, that was, they were doing that a long time ago, and Hoop, Hadoop seems to be fairly recent. Is there, were they doing a, was, was that like a precursor to this MapReduce, or were they doing something totally different? Well, I, I uh, didn't work with anything with SETI, so I don't honestly know how they did it, but I, um, you know, I know Hadoop has really grown more out of the search engines as they've tried to process more and more data. Um, certainly, I can imagine that search engine uh, techniques developed from prior techniques, right? It's hard to come up with something completely new, uh, but I don't know the history there. I, I can't tell you that. I'd, I'd be fascinated to try and find out, but I, I don't know. Okay, uh, let, let's take a quick look. This will just take a few minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll test my typing skills just a little bit here. But, uh, you know, I, again, I, I tend to run um, uh, 
um, oh, there we go. I, I tend to run Hadoop on a virtual machine. There are several that are available. Uh, so this is one from Cloudera. They have what they call their Cloudera Quick Start Virtual Machine. Uh, I think it's the easiest one to get up and running quickly for non-technical users. Uh, the downside is it does run in Linux, uh, Red Hat Linux, in fact. But uh, you know, I've installed a few different ones. There's one from Hortonworks called the Hortonworks Sandbox, uh, and that's where I first uh, read about Yarn. Uh, so you can try Hortonworks.com as well and see if their sandbox works for you. I had a lot of trouble getting that one to work, though, so I, I'm not a big fan of that one. Uh, and then there are there are others as well. You can uh, let's see. I work for Microsoft Partner, so you should probably use Bing and not Google. But uh, you, know, you can go out and search for uh, uh, you know Hadoop implementations that you can run on your local machine. Uh, you can also, if you don't want to do that, you don't want to fuss with installing. You can look into Amazon Web Services. They have a relatively inexpensive setup for uh, people who are just learning to develop code and. And, and test things out. It's it's not free, but it, it it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, so that's another option. Uh, but uh, so what we're going to do today, uh, as a quick demo, just a five-minute demo, uh, we're going to take a couple couple of text files that I'm going to create, and uh, we're going to do a word count just to illustrate the process. Uh, so the very first thing I'm going to do is create just two raw text files, and you'll see just how long they're going to be. Uh, so Linux is not my language of choice, so bear with me if I uh, um, make a few uh, few mistakes here. But uh, so there's our first text file. Hello world, how are you? And then. Uh, I'll create a second one, and you can imagine that the second file would be on a, a second partition, right? Uh, so I've created two text files in my local directory. Um, they're both very short, very short here. They have some, you know, some individual words, uh, and this will illustrate both how this works and also some of the pitfalls that you have to watch out for. Uh, so they're in my local file system. The first thing I need to do is distribute them to the Hadoop distributed file system. Uh, so the commands that I'm about to start issuing that all start with Hadoop are very much like the Linux command structure, but they're actually Hadoop commands. Um, so it's by design. You know, this is all built by people who like Linux. And so it, it, they've designed it to feel very much like Linux. But uh, what I'm going to do is put these various files into my HDFS folder that I created earlier. So this is the, uh, the partitioning process. And my cluster, my, my Hadoop cluster, will determine where these go specifically. Uh, although, again, because I have only a single node on this local machine, that's not very complicated to decide. Um, so I'm going to put them in this folder called word count uh, slash input. And that's that's all there is to the distribution part. Uh, I have a Java program. Actually, I'll go ahead and just show you quickly uh, what the Java program looks like. Um, uh, let's see. So it's word count dot Java. So somebody, not me, wrote this code. And it's just a, a relatively simple JavaScript, and and this is uh, um, this is the code that will actually be run by Hadoop. So it's it, I've pre-compiled this so that you guys don't have to sit here and watch me struggle to compile my code, uh, but but that's the code that's going to be run on these files, and all it does is it counts the number of of each word, how many times each word occurs. Uh, okay, so I've I've put my file there. I'm going to go ahead and run that Java file. Java program. Uh, you can tell I'm a statistician. Uh, let's see. So Hadoop Java. So 
So I've told it what program to run, and now I've got to tell it where to read the data from. So these are the two location, or the, the location I just put those two files. In that input folder. And then I also have to tell it where to put the output. And again, all of this can be automated as you, as you develop these uh, tools. Right? You'd have a name node that's in charge of determining all of this for you. You'd give it the instructions, and then it would know what to do each time. So that's the command that will actually, if all goes according to plan, run the, uh, uh, and of course, uh, let's see. So file already exists. So probably what that means is I didn't remove it earlier. So I'll do that. Create it. Try that command again. Okay, well, so here's where we learned that I'm not a Linux guy. Uh, but I already ran this earlier, so we have the output and we can actually view it. Um, uh, so let me uh, let me show you that. Does the folder have to exist first? Meaning, if uh, you just removed it and ran it, it literally. does. It, the output folder does have to exist first, but here I created it, right? So yeah, but it, it's complaining that it exists, so I thought maybe it had to be the opposite way, but I'm not sure. So, all right, well, uh, we're, we're at 8 o'clock, and I'm running into a technical glitch. So uh, what we get out of this is just a very simple list that tells us... Um, uh, let me just check one thing here. Let's see. Output. Okay. So. Yeah. So there, there are no files there. So I'm, I'm not sure what that error is. I apologize. I. I ran this not an hour ago, or two hours ago, but uh, what we would get out is just a very simple text file and it would list the number of times each word occurs. Um, you know, so you can, uh, you can imagine what that looks like, but this is the basic process. Um, uh, you can run all of this, so this is a Java program. Let me just mention that some of the other ways you can run this stuff, Python. Those of you that are in the bridge course in particular are learning Python. Uh, you're also learning R. Uh, that's where I've run most of this from. So, uh, you know, when I when I connect to Hadoop, I do so from R. Uh, um, you can run, you, you can write your own Java code if you know how to program in Java. Uh, and I, I'm sure there are, are dozens of other ways you can interact with it as well. Uh, Hive, for instance, that we talked about. Scoop can interact with it. Lots of ways can interact with this, but. Uh, um, you know, I, I hope this has illustrated the process, and I'm sorry that it didn't run correctly here. Uh, are there questions at this point? I know we're running right up at 8 o'clock here. So if I have a R program instead of Java, I can call R program? Uh, yeah, there's a package in R that can interact with Hadoop. So you can, uh, you can use the, uh, the methods in that package to interact with Hadoop directly. Thank you. I think it's even called R Hadoop. We just recently, um, those of us in the, in the Python class, played a little bit with um, IPython and its parallel processing. Mm -hmm. um, how does that, uh, I don't know, how does that compare to, to the Hadoop? That, that's an excellent question for a Python programmer. Um, <laughs> Andy, do you know? My, my impression is that Hadoop architecturally is parallel processing data. Does IPython do that too? You, you're talking about, um, I mean, I, I think it's more of a, you know, Kick, kick up to be able to run multiple CPUs, multiple threads at once, as opposed to 
having the data split up in a MapReduce format. There, there is a MapReduce architecture yeah. in Python, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. Or is it? it that, that was my takeaway from the lesson was that IPython, you, you're essentially um, starting up uh, processes that are, that are linked to a Python engine, and you just let, you just let those engines run in parallel. Right, so I, 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 think, guess, uh, I think the one is for processes and the other is for data. If, does that sound right? Hmm. Yeah, I, well, I know I, <laughs> whatever I read about Hadoop, it's always emphasizing that you push the data towards the CPUs versus, um, sorry, uh, move, move the processes towards the data versus the other way around. Yeah, so you don't it, have to, it's, it's uh, just trans like, transport a lot of data. Yeah, with, with, with Hadoop, you're, you're splitting your data in, into, I mean, you have multiple processors hitting the data at once, whereas in IPython, I think you have multiple threads of code as opposed to data running simultaneously. Hmm. Interesting. If, uh, assuming, I mean, when you, when you guys talk about IPython, I'm assuming you're talking about IPython like the process that runs the IPython notebook or maybe some other thing I'm less familiar with. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we, we learned in the class was IPython gives you, um, in the interface, a, a way to spin up more Python engines. Yes. Which, I guess, correspond to processes. Yes. And you can tell, what those, you can tell those processes do whatever you want them to do. So, so one is going parallel on the code and the other is going parallel on the data. They both are right. using CPUs to, and separate machine resources to do that, potentially. I guess, but you have different namespaces within the different processes of the IPython that that are potentially working on different data, right? That's kind of what we did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry, I wasn't there, and it's just so, I I haven't. Uh, th that may be a capability of IPython I'm not familiar with, so I, I guess I have to. Just, yeah, I think it talked a little bit. It talked a little bit about, if I remember right. I mean, I, I, I still feel very. I have a limited understanding for sure, but um, you know, it talked a little bit about some pushing different data. I think to the different, um, your different clients within that you spin up within IPython too. Okay. But uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so just quickly, because I know we're out of time. Uh, uh, so, one of the things I guess to learn as a data scientist is persistence, right? So, I I tried one other thing, and it seems to have worked. Uh, I guess you don't want to create the directory ahead of time. You want to let Hadoop create it for you for the output. So, I deleted it and ran it, and it ran fine. Uh, so, you can see here on the screen, these rows. It's giving progress updates for how long or for how far along you are in each task. Right? You can see mapping zero percent, reducing zero percent. And then after a little bit longer, it had mapped 67% of the data, reduced 0%. And then finally it finished mapping, and then it goes ahead and reduces, you know, and provides the final output. So let, let's, now we can take a look at the output of this. Um, yes. So I'll, I'll type the instruction that lets us browse the output. And what you see there is a count of each of the words that occurs. Uh, now, one, one thing I wanted to point out here, though, for the script that we ran, notice the last two words. You've got you, and then you've got you with a question mark. Uh, so you'd want to be more sophisticated, and you'd want to get rid of all the punctuation uh, so that those got counted as the same word. Right? But this is the basic idea of Hadoop. It takes those two text files. Each one might be written to a different node. Each node would then do its word count. That's, that's the mapping process. And then it would pass those word count results back to the master. And, and that's where they would be aggregated. And, and this is the out, outcome of that. You see that world occurs with a comma twice. Right? So that was once in each of the two files. 
Um, so, so that's a that's a basic uh, basic map reduce task. Uh, 